Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome aboard the Must Read Alaska show coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is a reader driven and a listener driven conservative news project launched in 2015. And next month, I want you to know we're celebrating completing our first six years. We'll be going into our seventh year. And what do we do here? We have a new site at mustreadalaska.com. It's all about Alaska for Alaskans. And we keep the mainstream media on their toes by kind of reporting the conservative side of the news, the, the side that they never report. We have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday newsletter that has updates and special items you won't read anywhere else, anywhere else in the world, and not even on the website. So we've got a lot of good news items there. And we have Club MRAC now, which is the legislative bulletin for discerning Alaskans. Let me tell you, it's legislative news exclusively. So if you don't like legislative news, you can just skip over that one. But this one gives you the skinny on what's going on in Juneau every single day of the legislature. And we really focus on um, the, the budget quite a bit there, which is, you know, that's the be all end all. We've got a YouTube channel. We feature political content there. And you can also find us on Rumble, which has got a lot of content that, that YouTube won't let us run because they're, they're in the censoring business. I'm Suzanne Downing and my co-host John Quick has the day off, but I am really glad to be joined today by Mike Robbins, candidate for Anchorage Mayor. And we are so happy to have you here, Mike, on the show. You, it's, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's, it's nice to be here. Congratulations on your six year anniversary. That's a huge mark. That's awesome. That's really, really nice. Thank you. And, uh, you know, in, in, at the core of our mission, it's just really what, what this is about, as we've always said, the mission is to help get better leaders and better policies. And it's an incremental business that we're in. We're not trying to just change the world in one day. But over time, we'd like to see better leaders and better policies. And so there are three conservative candidates running for Anchorage mayor and, and, and at least three liberals. I know we got about 14 that are going to be on the ballot. And we're just kind of talking to them in this series. And I wanted to talk to you today, Mike, and have you tell us about um, yourself, why you're, why you're running for office, and first, I thought, just start telling us a little bit about your bio, because there's a lot of people who see your signs, they hear your radio specials, but they don't know where you came from, how long you've lived in, in Anchorage, um, what sort of what formed you as a child and so forth. Great. Well, thanks. Uh, I moved. So first of all, I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, my dad's name is Merrill. My mom's name is Sandra. Um, they were both uh, second generation Arizonans. Um, they split up when I was a kid, and I ended up uh, living with my dad, and we moved to Alaska in 1975. Uh, I was a young kid, young kid at that point. I think I was 14. We moved to Spinard, uh, and I spent most of my formative years growing up uh, kind of kicking around Spinard. It was sort of like the Wild West in those days. We used to say, you know, they talk about Alaska being the last frontier. Well, Spinard was Alaska in those days, and it certainly was the last frontier. Uh, I'm married, uh, I have uh, three kids uh, and uh, one 23, uh, one who's 13 and one who's 18. Uh, I have a big, huge bloodhound named Boomer. And my wife and I have been married for 17 years. Actually, we're in our 18th year of marriage now. Uh, I've been a small business person most of my life. I started my first business when I was 17 with a couple of friends of mine out of high school. That was a door-to-door -door sales business, which was a lot of fun when we were kids. Uh, and then since then, I've worked in a variety of different businesses. I've worked in radio, I've worked in television, I've worked in newspaper. Uh, I spent some time in the janitorial business. I started a travel agency. I've had a couple of online businesses, uh, live events company, uh, currently a marketing and advertising agency, full service marketing firm here in Anchorage. And then we were in the radio business until just in November, uh, and we sold the last of our radio stations then. So very, very, very interesting. So I, I did not know that you sold your radio stations. I, I think of you as a guy who runs three or four radio stations. And, and you're, you're telling me now that you you're out of the radio business, out of the radio business. So two years ago, uh, somebody approached me 
uh, to buy two of my stations uh, and I sold those. Uh, and then we were kind of trying to decide, me and my wife had been praying about what we should do with the radio stations that we had remaining because it looked like the mayor's run was really starting to pick up steam and take off. And so believe it or not, uh, we were talking about it one Sunday and within two days, we received a call from a, a, a unsolicited offer from a church out of Seattle that bought the last two radio stations. Just at the last minute, they called and said, we want to buy them. We're going to come in and take over in a week. It was crazy. It was really, really crazy. So it certainly was, uh, I think, divine intervention. So and that cleared my deck so that I could run for mayor full time. And so that's what I'm doing now is running for mayor full time. Yeah, well, but you really are because the the t the day that you you announced that you were running for mayor, man, uh, the next day there were signs up everywhere, all over Anchorage, and you you just came out out of the pen just just with a roar. So you know, I was I was fascinated because I just finished watching a uh, a little video of you that you posted on your website, and that's um, robinsformayor.com. Is that right? Correct. Robins F O R mayor.com yeah, yeah some robins for mayor.com is all spelled out and um and it's on there and i kind of recommend it to people because it uh, it's five minutes so it's a, a long video but you talk a little bit about what i would consider sort of that that um that classic anchorage spinard upbringing um i almost i want i don't want to say you're a street kid but you're you say your dad was not home a lot because uh, he was working a lot and you were, you know, he was a single father and kind of were raising yourself. And so at times that didn't go well. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that. <laughs> well, it was, uh, my, my dad was traveling around the state. He, he was in Fairbanks and Kodiak and kind of all over working while I stayed in Anchorage trying to go to school. Uh, and of course, you know, if you leave a 14 year old boy on his own, um, he's going to find uh, things to get into. And of course, I was a 14 year old boy, so I found some things to get into. And, uh, you know, it was it was an interesting time in my life because, of course, uh, I got to learn. Uh, I got to learn a lot about uh, responsibility because you, you have to when you're sort of there raising yourself. But um, it was uh, it was interesting. And I, I, I did sort of uh, grow up. I don't know what to say. It's not like I lived on the streets of Spinard because I had a house. We we. Uh, uh, lived over off 36th and Cope Street. And then uh, as I grew up and, and got older, I continued to live in Spinard all over the area. But uh, it was it was interesting. You know, there was a lot of uh, the pipeline was in full speed. Uh, there was uh, a lot of really interesting signs between uh, the airport and Minnesota when you would come down Spinard. Uh, and it was it was just um, uh, lots of things for a young boy to get into. <laughs> oh boy, it sounds sounds like you had a little bit of a wild youth there, just the way you were you're explaining it in your video. And I recommend people go and check it out because they'll find a lot uh, about you and, it, and sort of what formed you, how you were raised, and then eventually you came to Christ and you changed your life. And right. um, and I, I don't exactly know the sequence of that, but you became a, a, a business person, you straightened your life around, but you know, you also had a, I think there was a story in the Anchorage Press a, a little bit about this as well, yep. early on. So you've been pretty, just, just sort of out there with that stuff. You're, you're not trying to hide the fact that you kind of had a, I don't know, was, was it a wild youth? Well, it was, you know, I had a wild youth and, and I think uh, wild, it was interesting. And, you know, I certainly went through a lot of things that I, that I don't, I uh, think most people should have to go through, but it was uh, it was an interesting time, you know, and one of the one of the things that I thought was really important when I decided to run for mayor was that one of the things we don't see a lot in our politicians now is transparency. Um, everybody thinks that you've got to be perfect. Everybody thinks that you can't have any blemishes. And, you know, I really feel like it's the things that we go through in our life who shape us and make us into who we are. And it gives us our character. It gives us our ability to handle situations. And, and, and uh, I think that it makes me well qualified to run the city right now with some of the things that we have going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and you've, uh, you've, so you've got your upbringing where you moved to, moved to Anchorage as a, as a young man, a young child, as a young child. And then you were raised uh, in Anchorage. You've lived in Anchorage all the rest of your life. You've, you've owned a number of businesses, radio stations and, and other businesses in Anchorage. And you still own a business in Anchorage and marketing, but how did you end up getting involved in, interested in politics to begin with? I mean, that you could have done a lot of different things. You could have been interested in, um, I don't know, hunting or fishing yeah. or something, but you're, you know, you're, you're kind of a political person. Well, I don't know if that, I mean, it's interesting. 
I, I saw the question and I thought about that. And, you know, um, I think I first got interested in politics as a young boy. Uh, I read a biography about John F. Kennedy, believe it or not. And, and while I've been a Republican my entire life, um, that reading that book and reading about uh, his life and about um, what he tried to do, I think that was the that was where I first started to pay attention to politics. I think I was in probably in like sixth or seventh grade at the time. And and so while I wasn't like a political wonk or anything my whole life, I was always interested in politics. And I really got into politics, I guess. Well, when you're in the radio business and you work at a talk station, it's kind of hard not to pay attention to what's going on. But, you know, in, in, um, when I was in uh, Arizona, I was in the radio business for a short time. I worked at a radio station as a sales guy. Uh, and then when I was here in Anchorage, I, I actually at one point ran a liberal talk station for the uh, for uh, a group that owned it. And then we flipped that to conservative. And I'd always kind of stayed out of the political uh, fray, if you will, because being in the radio business, I, can, I guess I'm like most business owners, you know, I, I, I don't want people to not do business with me because of my beliefs. And in today's world, because there's so, so much polarization on both sides. Um, people tend to like try to walk that line. And, and then back in 2016, uh, when Trump uh, was running for office and, and it was, I guess, when I really got involved, you know, I woke up one night in the middle of the night, I had this dream and I, I woke my wife up. It was about two 30 in the morning. She thought I was going nuts. Cause I was woke her up and I said, look, I got to get involved. I got to try to help Trump get elected. So you like him, you don't like him. I just felt like it was something I had to do. And so I got involved in that. Uh, and that was really when I started in politics was back in 2016 or when I got started to get involved, became a district chairman uh, because uh, the district 26 chairman resigned. And so I took over that job, uh, went down to this convention as a delegate, uh, or excuse me, an alternate delegate uh, for the, the Republican National Convention when when uh, Donald Trump was given the nomination. And then when I came back, I, I've been active in, in party politics, you know, helping the Republican Party raise money. Uh, working at the district level, helping other candidates. Uh, I was involved in a gubernatorial candidate. Uh, uh, you know, me, Treadwell ran for governor and I worked on his campaign as his campaign manager. And so it was kind of, I just kind of got involved because um, I got to this point where, and I think a lot of us do, I was, you know, 50 and I was like, you know, I got to do something. I mean, I, I, I just can't sit around anymore. I have too much to lose. You know, I had a house and my businesses and I was like, if I don't do something, I have no right to complain. And, and, and so I just, just took the course of action and decided to get involved in active. In the, I mean, I've always been active in the community, but never from a political standpoint. Yeah. Okay. So the, the only time I've known you is, is since about 20, I don't know, 2015, 2016, when right. you did get involved. So that's, that's why I kind of know you as a political person, but that actually is fairly recent in your life. And, and so now um, you've got this campaign for mayor, yes. and we all know that Anchorage has gotten off the rails and it's going in a terrible direction. And it's not a kind of place that is easy to recommend to people at this point. It's so, um, you know, it's it's just gone down this path for for so long for for six years of uh, you know the homelessness increasing and things getting really dire. The business is leaving, things being boarded up. And what what is your overall vision for Anchorage? And you know, how do you intend to get us there? What's what's the vision that Mike Robbins brings for Anchorage? Well, I got to tell you, Suzanne, I love Anchorage. I, I I love this city. I really do. I feel like it's given me an opportunity to build a life that I couldn't have built elsewhere, uh, from the time I grew up as a kid until now. And so I really love the city, and it it really concerns me to see what's happened to her and see what see the direction that we've gone, whether it be the vagrants and the homeless, whether it be the, the crime statistics. I've been a victim of crime at my office three times since I've been here in 18 months. And, and so my vision of Anchorage is I really uh, desire to make Anchorage a safer, cleaner, more prosperous place. And, and to do that, we have to address our crime. We've got to lower our crime rate. We've got to start to prosecute petty crime. Uh, and to do that, we need to support our police and we need to make sure that we support our prosecutors because they're overworked. We also need to work with the state to make sure that, that we can encourage them to prosecute some of the felony crimes. We also need to deal with our homeless problem. And I know we're going to talk about that more in a minute, so I won't go into detail about that. But we also have to deal with our municipal spending. Our municipal government is way out of whack. You know, uh, it is anti-business. Uh, it takes 
10 months to get permits for, for projects that should take 10 days. Um, we do nothing in this city to foster growth. And, and, and as mayor, that's really one of the visions I have. So I wanna put us back on a track to where we're small business friendly. And then I, I see a city that's moving into the future. That's one of the things that, that really excites me about Anchorage and excites me about running for mayors. We have so much opportunity, Suzanne. We've got an airport that's one of the busiest in the world. We've got a port that brings in 80% of the, of the goods that comes into the state. We've got a railroad. We've got a new railroad that's gonna be built from Alberta to Anchorage. There's so many things that if we just lift our vision a little bit, I think we can make Anchorage a very, very exciting place to live again. Like it used to be when I was a kid growing up, I used to brag about the city to my friends all the time. And now um, I had a friend call me six or seven months ago and tell me his, his daughter-in-law and son were moving here. And I, I was cautiously, um, I was very cautious about telling what a, that I thought that was a great idea because of our crime, because of our poor education system. So anyway, that, my vision is really, I want to have a city that my daughter, when she's you know, 23 and gets married, uh, she wants to stay here. She wants to raise her family. Um, so that my son who got out of college and had to come back because of COVID, he wants to stay here because he can get a good job and he wants to get married and raise his family here. So that's my vision for this city. I really want to bring her back to a place where uh, where we're cleaner, safer, and more prosperous for everybody. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that that's kind of where we were heading. And when, when Dan Sullivan was our mayor, he, he kind of had to deal with a, a budget that he was left with, which was in tatters and he had to do a lot of cuts. Totally. We thought maybe maybe we thought things weren't gonna go well for a while, but but our, our city was more prosperous and we did a, a great job. And, and then we've been through six years now of just absolute decline. And, and it's just, a, this, the city's a, a shadow of its former self. It's really sad to see. And, and so, your overall vision is safer, cleaner, more prosperous. Yes. Um, and place that your kids want to return to and that they'll want to raise their families in. Yes. And so what is your top worry about Anchorage? Like, what do we have to address first? How do you intend to address it? So my top worry is getting our city open again and getting our economy moving. I believe that, uh, that what's been done, the oppressive management of the COVID uh, pandemic really has hurt us in ways that we haven't even realized yet. And so my top priority as mayor is going to be to begin to, on day one, I'm going to start opening this city up. I mean, you know, pay attention to science. We can take care of people. I mean, we can be, a, we can be very safe about this. And I'm also going to let people know, Suzanne, that if they get sick, we can take care of them. I mean, that's the one thing that we need to communicate as a government is that it's okay. I mean, we're going to be careful, but it's we have the best medical care in the world. We can take care of you if you get sick, and that's important for people to know. It's not these fear tactics that they're using. So, the number one priority for me is getting the economy open. In order for us to do that, of course, we've got to we've got to get rid of these restrictive AOs. We've got to work with our hospitality industry and our tourism industry to start to rebuild those. And then we also need to work with our retail sector because one of the hidden damages that's been done by this pandemic is the fact that we drove all of the consumers in Anchorage online. We drove them to Amazon. We drove them places that it's very, very hard to get them back from. And that's the city's fault, or I shouldn't say fault, but it's their responsibility. They kept these oppressive orders in place for too long. And so as mayor, I look at it as my responsibility to help rebuild that. We've got to get that, and we're, there's not even talk about that part of our economy, but I know from being in the radio business and being in the marketing business, it's tough to get a customer back once you've lost them. And we're going to have to help them do that. And so my number one priority is the economy. And it's great that my, all my competitors have started to talk about the economy now too, and that's excellent. But as a person who has spent his entire, most, I would say I've spent, you know, 85% of my working life creating payroll not cashing a paycheck. I know how to do that. I'm the one who is uniquely qualified to be able to work with these sectors in our economy to get them restarted. I mean, I like to hear, I love to hear some of my competitors in these forums talk about how they're pro small business. It's great to be pro small business. Well, I am small business. I'm a small business guy. It's how I pay my mortgage. It's how I 
take care of my family. I mean, that's, I am small business. So anyway, sometimes I get on that Halloween. No, that's <laughs> so. you, know, you raised something really interesting with the Amazon and how everybody has gone to Amazon. And I'm, I'm like that too. I have, I have done that as well. I've just, I don't want to be um, har- harassed in the stores. I don't want to have to stand in line outside of Costco and just stand there in the cold waiting for Crazy. my turn to get in. Um, I don't want to be yelled at by store clerks. So I, I'm a lot of, I moved a lot of my own commerce online, but I got a note from somebody today. This will catch you. Um, this is a little, little bunny trail. He said he ordered three small hand truck tires from Amazon with prime shipping, right? And the total order was $8 for each tire. And it was $24, including shipping. And the tires arrived. Um, it was about 10 pounds. It was five days before they arrived. So he got them in five days. So that he he measured the box and he went down to the post office and he uh, priced it for how much it would cost him if he mailed a box weighing that uh, that amount to somebody for the exact same service instead of the twenty four dollars that he paid for the three tires including shipping it would have paid he would have had to pay eighty four dollars and eighty five cents just for the postage and his point was we as Americans are subsidizing Amazon without a doubt. Without a doubt, because, because we is. because we don't get the same rate at the post office that Amazon gets, That's and right. so we are hurting our small business owners, and we're subsidizing this huge monstrosity called Amazon that's now starting to. Well, you know what Amazon Amazon's yeah. doing? They're th- they're do. doing things like deplatforming people. Yeah. So so fascinating because um, it's we we do need to rebuild our our economy for our small business owners, and that is quite a task. And I don't know how you how you get there once people have changed their habits. I don't know what you do other than perhaps, you know, work with incentives. You've got to be have probably carrot and stick on that, but let's, let's just switch for a minute and talk about homelessness because it is one of the things that's on everybody's mind. Uh, we've got this homeless industrial complex. We've turned the Sullivan arena into what we were told was a temporary facility. And now it looks like it's a permanent facility. My understanding is that people are being attacked in there, that it is an unsafe place. We're not getting a chance to hear about that because the, um, the, the communication coming out of there is very controlled. Mm-hmm. But we've, we're becoming a magnet for a place where rural Alaska can send its uh, misfits and miscreants. They can banish people from their villages. We don't get to banish people from our village. Um, so we inherit a lot of people uh, coming to our town because we're creating uh, a big infrastructure to support them. Yep. What what do we do about this? I mean, I feel like if it was fixable, a lot of cities on the West Coast would have fixed it already, mm-hmm. but they didn't fix it in Seattle or San Francisco or Los Angeles or Hollywood or any place. I mean, all of cities are struggling with this. What can we do um, to solve it? Well, first of all, um, I hate to have us compare it to Salt Lake or excuse me, to San Francisco or LA or Seattle, because I think what it takes, if, if we're gonna really fix this problem, Suzanne, we have to have the will as a city to stop it and to fix it. And I think what's happening in a lot of these West Coast cities is, I think they have a will, but they have a will for enabling and, and allowing folks to continue in the behavior. You know. Uh, as, as you saw from my video, I have in my in my background, I have I have some experience with uh, with with things that affect homelessness. And, you know, I, th- I think that the, the number one thing that we have to do, first of all, is we have to let people outside of Anchorage know that we're closed for business when it comes to being homeless. Right. This isn't a place that's going to be fun to be homeless in. And it's not going to be a place. I read an article uh, because I've spent a ton of time on this issue because it is so important to the voters. But we have to stop enabling the behavior. And we have to, as you said, <laughs> work with the homeless industrial complex. You know, the biggest challenge that we have right now with that complex is they're all operating in different silos and they're not working together. They're all addressing their little parts of the problem. And so what we need to do is we need to attack this problem at its base. All right. We need to stop people from entering homelessness. And once they get into the homeless, the, hel- the homeless flow, if you will, we need to get them out of there as quickly as possible. You know, I was I, I had breakfast with somebody this morning from Wasilla who has a, who, who's dealing with homelessness out there. And one of the things I said to him was and, and I didn't I told him I didn't want to be discompassionate or I, I didn't want to seem like I lacked compassion. But, you know, it used to be 
when, when I was a kid and I was using drugs and I was on the street, you know what got me off of the street and got me off of drugs? Was it because someone gave me a handout? It was because somebody made it really uncomfortable for me to be in that position. And not only that, it was the pressure from society that, that I, it wasn't okay for me to live there. It wasn't okay for me to be that way. And so it created the internal desire in myself to change my lot. And, and you know, what's happening right now in our city is we're just, we're just big enablers. We're just, a, we're buying these people houses. We're buying all of their meals. I mean, we spend, I, I've heard as high as $52,000 a year on every single homeless person here. That's a crazy number. When you think we spend $3,700 a year, I think, um, on the people who live in Anchorage, the 300 and some thousand, 17,000 that live here in the city. So what we need to do is we have to attack the problem at its base. We need to use the law, get our arms around these folks. We need to stop the camps. The camps are illegal and we need to deal with that. You know, my competitor likes to say, well, we're going to need to buy some warehouses to put people's stuff in. Well, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not as uh, sure that I want to buy warehouses to keep your stuff in. I think we just need to, we just need to stop the illegal behavior. So. Well, we've got a, a, a lot of uh, drug and alcohol issues, obviously, and um, I don't want to discount the whatever trauma people have had in their lives that led them to the place where they're at. But there, you know, it is obvious that some people do need treatment. But is it our ability as Anchorage to actually, are we going to be able to afford this massive uh, um, amount, this AO66, where you're, we're buying these buildings and this one's going to be... This one's going to be a homeless shelter. This one's going to be a drug treatment center. This one's going to be a you know halfway house. Um, how are we how are we possibly going to afford all that? Well, I think that the way we afford that is that we we use our heads and we find a way to involve private industry with our nonprofits and our churches. I've I've had conversations with some folks in private industry who want to open up new treatment facilities here in Anchorage, and that's the key. The key is we've got to, that's the, and, and that's the biggest difference between myself and Forrest Dunbar and Bill Falsey is that I'm not looking for a government solution to our problems. I'm looking for a solution that's going to allow our community to solve the problems on their own. I'm for smaller government. I'm for less intervention in your life and less control over your life. Whereas my competitors are for the exact opposite. They want us to be more dependent on the services and the things that they provide to us. They want us to think, I, I, I'm sick of listening to Bill Falsey talked about how tough it is to do what he does, right? If it, <laughs> I'm so sick of listening to it because yeah, it might be tough to do what he does, but what's really tough is what he's done to us in his time as city manager. He's destroyed this city. So I digress, but I mm -hmm. wanted to answer your, I hope I answered your question. No, I mean, that's really interesting. You're basically saying that actually, if the government does step in and create um, these kinds of solutions, uh, then it does actually drive out the faith community and it drives out um, nonprofits and it drives out uh, the private sector. But we also realize that some of these nonprofits, they've never come up with a plan for putting themselves out of business. Right. And they are in the business of taking care of homeless, but they're not in the business of finding ways that their services are no longer needed. So so let's just talk a little bit about Forrest Dunbar, because um, I've seen some polling and I'm sure you have, too. And he's obviously the one to beat uh, on the on the left. We've got 14 people on the ballot. Uh, <laughs> Forrest Dunbar is is the one who has you know, he's got the seat on the assembly. He's got the name recognition. He's run for Congress. He's, he's his second term on the assembly. And so obviously he's got to move on. He's either going to be mayor. He's probably going to run for governor, do something else. He's a, a he's got ambitions. What is what, what are you going to be able to, to do to um, to convince voters that you are the person rather than Forrest Dunbar? Well, I think that that what what can what's ha what's been convincing voters uh, and what's 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 been showing up in our, the, in our internal polling we've been doing. And what's making, what, what's resonating with people is the fact that Forrest has spent his entire life, it, 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 and it it's really boils down to this, Suzanne, if you like the way the city is running, if you like the way that we're operating, if you like the way we're being treated, then you should vote for Forrest Dunbar. If you want something different, if you want someone who understands how to solve tough problems, if you want someone who, doesn't just think he knows how to lead, but has demonstrated leadership by building multiple companies from the ground up. 
then that's me. If you want someone who understand, you know, I had to close my two of my businesses last year because of COVID. I understand what's happened in this city. I've been a part of it. Forrest hasn't skipped a beat. He hasn't missed a paycheck. He has no empathy for what's going on. So I'm going to, through messaging, what we've been telling people and talking with people about is what, what there's, there's a, could it be a more dramatic difference between the two of us than we have? Forrest is for more taxes, more government, more intervention in your life and less personal liberty. I'm for less taxes, more personal freedom, greater opportunity and a vision to build Anchorage into a shining city where we can really <clears throat> lead the rest of the state. We have, we have a huge vision for the city that we didn't get a chance to talk about, but maybe we could talk again sometime and I'll tell you all about it. Well, no, I think we're going to for sure. And and so final comments, I just, um, you know, we're, we're winding up toward the end of the show here and want to make sure that people know how to reach you and how to, uh, how to see you at events. Um, your website again is robins mayorcom and that's all spelled out. Mm -hmm. And then we do have a fundraiser coming up uh, this coming Thursday at the Petroleum Club from six to eight. Uh, that's being hosted by several members of the club, and you're welcome to come. And that's listen. the 11th, right? It is on okay. Thursday uh, from six to eight, and you're welcome to come out, talk, listen. Uh, I love we, we spend a lot of time doing sort of a town hall kind of meeting where we answer questions because I think it's. More important for folks to hear what um, hear what I would say about their specific challenge than it is for me to talk about what I would, you know, do as a politician. So very good. And so for anybody who's interested, obviously there is the um, the fundraiser on the 11th at the Petroleum Club, and obviously you've you've got the website, which is a really great website, by the way. It's got some really nice graphics on there, and so um, people should go there and learn more about you there, and especially uh, check out that five minute video. It is well worth your time, people. And you don't see politicians very often talking about kind of their rough and tumble upbringings and the parts of their lives that they they that have formed them and they they not necessarily proud of but they also acknowledge that this is a journey that we're all on and we all have different kinds of hardships and things that we have to overcome so great job on that and for the rest of the week everybody just you know do sign up for the must read alaska newsletter you get tons of great content there including you know club mrac that'll come to you every day from the halls of the Capitol. We've got a lot of great help inside the Capitol building. I'm not going to Juno this year. I'm going to try to stay out of there. It's the, the right thing to do. It's the healthy thing to do. And uh, be, be sure to tune in in the, in the midweek for our uh, Must Read Alaska podcast with Scott Levesque. He is our, our Wednesday, Thursday host. He does a fantastic job. He always has interesting things to say. And sometimes he's got some really great guests, like last week when he had Representative James Coffin on and it was a really good show. If you're a supporter of Must Read Alaska, thank you so much for that. It makes all of this possible to stand up for what's right in Alaska. And if you'd like to support the conservative side of the news, well, donate buttons on the right side there of mustreadalaska.com. Of course, it's on the right side. So your support allows us to stay strong, independent, thoughtful, and standing up against the big blue wave of the activist liberal media. So until next week, we're signing off from somewhere in Alaska.